Gorilla Tech, how you yeah, doing, brother? Man, I'm good, man. Blessed. Blessed to be here, man. Appreciate the opportunity. Miami's own. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Born and raised? Born and raised, man. Born and raised. Uh, my family's from Honduras. Um, you know, so definitely grew up in the Latin background. You know what I'm saying? Uh, listening to all types of music. You know what I mean? Just, you know, just being a part of the culture. I feel that. So what was like your growing up what kind of sounds like what kind of artists if you remember the names do you remember hearing on a saturday having to clean up the crib and everything like that what were what were your, your mom and your pops playing man they would play they would play uh this haitian band called bossa combo they would play um a lot of bob marley they would play um luis calaf which is a, merengue, a dominican merengue artist you know, he's kind of like responsible for the, um, what we call typical, merengue typical, you know, with the accordion, you okay. know what I'm saying? So my dad would always play those type of records. Um, and, you know, every Sunday it would be a party at the house. Like my crib was like where everybody would come and just vibe, you know what I'm saying? After a soccer game, they would come migrate and, um, you know, I would play records. You know what I'm saying? I would play my dad records at the time. You know what I mean? What age was this? Uh, I probably was, uh, I would have to say maybe 11, 12. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, 11 or 12, I, I, I would play his records for his company. Gotcha. You know what I mean? So, um, and this box was like deep. You know, he, he had all types of records, you know, a lot of Jamaican records, a lot of um, Haitian records. A lot of Caribbean records, you know what I mean? And um, he would kick my ass if I scratched the fucking records, you know what I mean? No doubt. Like, yeah, shit was crazy. That's what's up. So you got introduced to vinyl from your pops then? Basically. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So your first collection and your, and your just first music knowledge was really passed down from him? It was, it was passed down from him. Um, his crate was different though, you know what I mean? Um, Around the time that I was aware of of, um, of the music that he that I was around, I also got introduced into um, hip hop. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that's around the time that uh, Run DMC just popped off. Okay. You know Houdini, and I think I, it's, it's safe to say that I was like around 1982, 83. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, it was a big thing for us to have that rock box, the the first Run DMC album, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And at that point, I would buy records every week. You know, my mom would give me an allowance just for, you know, making sure I stayed in school and doing my homework and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And she would give me an allowance uh, of $20. That's you know a lot of money for That's back then. That's a lot of money back then. It was a lot of money. <laughs> so with $20, I can buy at least four records right you know four or maybe three records because at the time 12 inches were like four dollars sometimes five uh -huh. you know what i'm saying so i would just you know every week go to the record store and just buy vinyl like i would buy all the everything that was on profile everything that was on enjoy everything that was on sugar hill right you know what i mean so that would be my daily weekly stuff so when you were Finally, out buying your own vinyl out here in Miami. Mm -hmm. What were the, some of the shops you were visiting? You know, uh, Peaches. Okay. Uh, there was this little shop, um, this record store that was on Seventh Avenue and um, I think Fifty Something Street. It's no longer there. Right. I forgot the name of it, but I would go there religiously. Between that store, um, Peaches and Blue Notes. Blue Notes. Yeah, Blue Notes had. All the joints, you know. What I mean, Blue Notes was like your uh, your discogs. If you if you you know if you if you're a DJ and you're familiar and you and you you know DJ with vinyl, you're familiar with discogs. Of course, so they had like all the jazz, all the funk, all the soul, hip hop, R and B, like you know, like that was the spot to go to. So I would see them regularly. What was the DJ culture in Miami in the '80s, mid '80s, late '80s? In the 80s, uh, the DJ culture was like, we would have DJs like Ghetto Style, 
Party Down, um, uh, Triple M, Vicious Funk, uh, Space Funk. And, and then, like, these were DJs that would bring out a whole bunch of, like, their whole sound system. You know what I'm saying? They would bring out a whole bunch of bass bins, uh, scoops, and um, they would play. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and at the time, you know, that was the thing. You know, everybody would come out and just rock out to the, the, the joints that they were playing. You know what I'm saying? So the DJ culture was very, very, very... Uh, at its highest peak at that time, you know what I'm saying? So you had guys like Disco Dave, um, uh, who else? A few, a few other guys. I can't think of them right now, but start yeah. back. Start say say a few other guys. Say. Yeah, so a few other guys other than Disco Dave. Um, How about Uncle Al? Was he out Uncle at that time? Uncle Al. Well, Uncle Al. Uncle Al came in. Uh, around, I would say, 87, 88, if I'm not mistaken. I may have the years wrong, but he came out like a little bit, little bit after that. Sugar Hill DJs. Okay. Can't forget Sugar Hill DJs. Like, they were the DJs that, in every hood, you see them post up, you know what I'm saying? Doing this thing, you know? Um, so, yeah, that was the culture, man. Like, every, every Saturday, you, in any block, you would see... Any, any of those DJs set up with their bass bands and just rocking the crowd, you know what I mean? That's what's up. So it was more about the block parties back then and not really going to clubs and stuff like that. It was, it was, it was for me, because for me, I was young at the time, you know right. what I mean? Like I, I wasn't in the clubs at the time, you know what I mean? I was too young to even get in the bar, you know what I mean? So it was mainly about the block parties, Okay. you know what I mean? They'd be at different parks just setting up and everybody just having a you know dope time. Okay. So how, how did... Um, you know, you went from just buying, collecting vinyl. How'd you transition into actually doing parties? What was that transition? Um, like? Well, before I started doing parties, uh, official parties, um, I would I would like uh, party at. Diff I would do house parties. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like friends' house parties because they knew like I was the the kid on the block that had, you know, all these records and and um and the speakers and the systems. You know what I mean? Um, so I would do those first, you know, and around the same time I was building my own speakers, mm. you know what I'm saying? Like I was, you know, like literally making my own little speaker sets, you did. And, you know, I would take those and kind of like test them out, uh, any opportunity I had, you know what I mean? Doing, uh, those parties around the block, uh, or at the school, you know, when I used to go to Edison, mm. Edison middle, you know, I would bring my shit over there and do the pep, um, uh, the prep rallies, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, pep rallies and, you know, just rock out, man, you know what I mean? So that was like, you know, really uh, getting into the vibe of uh, playing music, you dig? Other than just collecting and learning how to scratch. What was the DJ name back then? <laughs> I had a few, man. I had a few DJ names, man. Like, if I, <laughs> back then, I, uh, uh, it was DJ Fizz. Okay. DJ Splash. <laughs> DJ Doc Def. Okay. Um, uh, and then last it was DJ Tony Tone. Tony Tone. That was like the last name before I went into the, the tech. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? DJ Tony Tone, um, I was, uh, doing a lot of uh, tour DJing with Luke and Disco Rick at that time. At that point, when I was DJ Tony Tone, I was actually just um, doing shows with Disco Rick and Luke. You know what I mean? And at that time, I was like the scratch DJ. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, I would go on there, and before they come on, and I, you know, go do my thing on the ones and twos. You know what I'm saying? So what was that like touring with Luke in the heyday? Man, <laughs> let me tell you, man. Touring with Luke was a uh, was a new. Ex it wasn't a new experience. It was a uh, an updated experience because before then, I was I was touring with Disco Rick. Okay. Okay. Just give you a little history on Disco Rick. Disco Rick was one of the DJs that um, um, used to rock with Party Down DJs and SES Express. 
And this is around the time that, you know, the DJs would do block parties and set up their speakers and do their thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So Disco Rick, which is the guy who, um, the voice of King of Diamonds. You know what I mean? Like when you listen to uh, uh, the commercials out here in Miami and you, and you, and you hear uh, K-O-D, you know, that's Disco Rick. You know what I mean? Mm. So he was the guy that basically introduced me into... Um, uh, making beats because you know at the time when I was touring with him he would have the MPC 60 and we we would use that as a sampler you know with crowds and you know kind of like samples in there like it's a replay type thing exactly but back it's the, it's the replay was out at the time but he decided to get the drum machine oh, okay and we used it as a sampler you know what I mean so um, we would go on a roll with that okay and um, once we got done touring um, he was like, yo, here's the manual. Hmm. You know what I mean? Go ahead and learn how to use the shit. And um, once I managed to learn how to operate it, you know, I was creating um, Miami bass music. You know, at the time, I might be all over the place right now, but it's, 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 it's very important to, uh, uh, to like let people know like where it stemmed from. You know what I mean? Before we go into Luke. Give us the year of right now with Disco Day. What year are we with talking Disco about? Rick, with Disco Rick, it was um, 1989, 88, 89. Okay. Yeah, 88, 89. So you know, before Luke. Before Luke. Okay. Before Luke. With Luke, it was like 1993. Okay. You know what I'm saying? But before Luke, it was Disco Rick and the Dogs. Gotcha. You know what I mean? They the one that had a song called Your Mama's on Crack Rock, uh, Take It Off, you know, a lot of local Miami classics. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, he gave me my first beat machine. I learned it and I started uh, uh, programming on there. That Back then, I was just a beat maker, you know what I mean? Because I had no inkling of how to produce. Mm -hmm. I was just kind of putting sounds together and, and just creating, not creating, but finding my sound and learning how to uh, uh, produce, well, make beats. Right. You know what I mean? Learning the beat machine. Right. You dig? So, around that time, um, I did his album called The Negro's Back. Um, after that, we did an album called, um, I did an album with uh, this uh, artist out of Tampa, I believe. Her name was Sexy C. And they were all signed to Joy Boy label, uh, Joy Boy Records, which is one of the old school labels from Miami. Okay. You know, other than Luke, um, On Point, uh, Jam Packed, um, Suntown. These were all like little labels that were, um, from Miami, right. I was putting out local music. Right, you know what I'm saying. So Joy Boy was one of them. You know, um, uh, so so like I said, we did the Sexy C album. I did the Dogs album, which I literally programmed and scratched throughout the whole album. You know, I got credited as a as a beat maker and produ uh, not producer, but uh, and a DJ. You know what I mean? Because I was it was early in the game. Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand the business. But, you know, Rick got credited as a producer because he basically did produce the album. And I just came in as like, okay, this is your idea. Let me just put it together. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that was my first taste of knowing, uh, learning how to produce, mm -hmm. seeing how he put stuff together. You know what I'm saying? So shouts out to Disco Rick. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah. Uh, I did Nasty Dance. I did Dogga Mix. A few of these local records that were very known in Miami, you know what I mean? Um, and part of that Miami bass scene when it was at its, at its highest, you know what I mean? And we were neck and neck with Luke. Right. Because Luke had the two live crew, you know what I'm saying? Shouts out to Mr. Mix. You know, Mr. Mix is like another producer that kind of like created the Miami sound along with Eric Griffin. Eric Griffin was another producer that was affiliated with Triple M DJs that would um, manipulate the 808s. You know, back then we would, well, he would make the 808s uh, 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 sound like a bass line. Mm. You know what I mean? So all those different tunings of bass, of 808s, was inspired by him. Him and DJ Magic Mike. Right. In Orlando, you know what I mean? Right. So around that time, like, everybody was figuring out new ways of uh, of of uh, uh, flipping the 808 sound, right? Because before the 808 was just 
a regular knock, a regular, you know, boom. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But Eric Griffin, um, he found a way to manipulate it and do different tones. You know what I'm saying? What so, do you, not to cut you off, but mm -hmm. you, you bring up Mike. Magic Mike. Okay, so when you bring up Magic Mike, I know Orlando, you know, has got his own scene and everything like that. Right. Was he around here too, coming down? Yes, and, definitely. In the mix? Magic Mike would come down to uh, work with uh, Primetime Records. Primetime Records was another label out of Miami. Okay. Um, and he would DJ and make beats. You know what I'm saying? Um, he was responsible for, well, he, he was part of that, um, that, that, that new wave of Miami bass, you know, along with Mr. Mix, Eric Griffin, Clay D. Clay D is another producer that flipped that drum machine with SP-12. At the time, it was the SP-12. They didn't have the SP-1200. It was the SP-12. Right. The first one. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, you know, they're like really the pioneers that kind of molded, uh, that, Miami bass sound, you know what I mean? I came a little after, but those are the guys that kind of like, um, how can I say, uh, they, 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 they created the foundation. I got you. You know what I'm saying? Pioneers. Pioneers. Right. You know what I mean? So, um, that was that. You did what I'm saying? Uh, and then, you know, after me and Rick did our thing, uh, I started dealing with Luke, you know, and at the time he was not with the two live crew, it was just Luke, because, you know, they was going through their issues or whatever. And, um, um, you know, me and Luke started vibing and he heard about my skills as a DJ and he was like very impressed. And, you know, we tried a little thing and we made it work, you know what I mean? So I started touring with him. So my experience with him was on a whole nother level because of his name, you know, his crowds were huge. Right. Anytime Luke would come out, you know, Detroit, Alabama, Atlanta, it was like a full sold out arena. You know right. what I mean? So um <laughs> Luke would be on stage fucked up, man. Like before he get on stage, it's it's guaranteed that he would have a, a gallon of Bacardi. Damn. Like Luke would get fucking lit. <laughs> before lit was even before, a thing. <laughs> yo, man, Luke would get so turnt. You know what I mean? I can tell you stories on before, like as we going through the playlist before he get on stage. That shit was an experience. Shouts out to Verb Three Hundred Five, man, because he was there too. You know, Verb Three Hundred Five, the guy who's on um, Scarred. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Him and Trick Daddy. You know what I mean? You know, we have a lot of stories. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? Okay, so being Uncle Loose tour DJ. In the heyday, right there, mm -hmm. sold out arenas all over the country, and you, you, you know, you saying he's drinking a bottle of Bacardi, gallon bottles of Bacardi before he gets out on stage, yeah. And then you having to keep the show going as a DJ, yeah. Tell me some of the challenges, some of the stories you have with just you know rocking with Luke, like some of the memorable stories. <laughs> Man, let me tell you. Before we would get on stage, I would always, um, Luke would always call me um, to go over the playlist, you know, and at the time, he had all his, um, all the songs that he was performing on, um, on vinyl, all the show versions on vinyl, you know what I mean? So there wasn't no CD, it was all vinyl, like all the show versions were cut on vinyl specifically for him. Right. So, you know, we would go over the list and Luke would always <laughs> have some shit going on. You know what I mean? I, I want to put my dude out there, but you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's all love. That was that was then. You're right. Um, but it would always be a situation with him and um, uh, us before going on stage. So one time... Um, we were going over the playlist and the, 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 the chick that he was with at the time or the groupie or whatever, whoever it was, right. um, was like, damn, you know, 
your DJ is sexy. You know what I mean? Like, you know, whatever. She said some shit. And then Luke was like, uh, yeah, you know, shit. If you want to you wanna suck his dick? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yo, you want to give him some hair? Like, yeah, go ahead. So I'm like, oh, shit. Like, put me <laughs> on the spot. You know what I mean? At the time, I wasn't, I'm not going to say I wasn't used to it. You right. I, mean? I already knew what to expect, but it was like, whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. So... <laughs> So we would we would actually get so lit, man, prior to going on stage. Right. You know what I mean? And those chicks was like ready, like down for whatever. And it was just ha- you know, just a fun time, man. You know what I mean? And we had a uh, lots of fun, lots of memories, you know, prior to getting on stage and shit. You know what I mean? Most people they got this the stories. They do the show, then after the show, the after party and everything's going on. Before y'all even hit the stage. Nah, man. Before we even hit the stage, shit was Still got to do the show. Yeah, still before... got to do the show. But <laughs> Groupie action. Groupie getting, actions. All getting day. lit, everything. Everything, man. You know what I mean? It was it was a hell of experience. You know what I mean? Um, and, I, and I'm blessed because, you know, a lot of times, like, shit was reckless. Right. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm blessed that I'm still, you know, healthy. <laughs> Amen. You know, healthy, uh, no STDs, no nothing. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, it was it was a hell of experience. And um, dealing with Luke, he would always switch up at the last minute, right? While he was on stage, because he was clearly, you know, intoxicated. He'd be like, "Nah, I want to do that next." He'll cue me, yo, number two or number three. You know what I mean? And I would have to on the fly kind of get that. Get that 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 next song ready, you know what I'm saying? It um sometimes it wouldn't always go smooth, right? You know, because sometimes the needle would jump. Of course, you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, man, you know, I, I made it work. You know, I, I adapted to the situation, and um, and as I said, it was challenging at times because you know when someone is in that mind state when they lit, you just never know what to expect. You know what I'm saying? If shit don't go right, he might say. You know, what the fuck you doing? You know what I mean? You know, like, yeah. MCs then were notorious for blaming the DJ if shit go wrong. You know what I mean? Of course. But if the needle skip, hey, that has nothing to do with me. You know what I mean? Like, that's just the fucking needle. Exactly. You know what I mean? But we never got into the situation where he would be like, you know, tell the DJ, fuck you. You know what I mean? Like, you know, sometimes people would do it just to get, he would do it just because he will get the, the crowd involved. Right. At the time, I didn't understand. But... You know, now when I think back, okay, it's just for show. Exactly. You know what I mean? So it, it never took it personal, but um, uh, not to say he did that with me. Right. But I've seen other shows where he would go off on a DJ because shit didn't go right. Right. And he would blame the DJ because, you know, he wasn't on point with his shit. Right. You know what I'm saying? But it was a it was a learning experience. And um, yeah, you know. So coming back home after touring with Luke. Uh, did you go the DJing route? Did you start going back into the studio and just doing more production? Or were you doing both at the time? I was doing both. I was still doing both. I was still, you know, uh, producing for a lot of uh, a lot of up-and-coming local artists from Miami. Excuse me. And that was like in, in 1993. So... Uh, Around that time, I would I would still be you know doing my thing and finding my sound as far as producing wise, you know what I'm saying. So yeah, I got back into that, and um, uh, around that time, I was with uh, uh, my homies. You know, me and my homies, we we kind of like formulated a company called the Lab, mm-hmm. other other um, known as the Committee, and the Committee was five of us, you know, um, uh, Fence, Chapter, Carl Boss, and Track 5-3, and myself, you know what I mean? And we were guys that, 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 like, had the same passion for wanting to make it in this industry and just doing it for the love, you know what I'm saying? Um, we did a lot of hits, I mean, not a lot of hits, but a lot of records for uh, and these are like local guys, you know, um, Suicide, Black Haze, Lil E, um, uh, who else? Mentally Disturbed, um, Uncle Al, mm-hmm. um, 
Who else? Who else? Who else? Let me think. Um, Trick Daddy. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Shouts out to Slip and Slide. That's around the time that, you know, I had my first placement with Atlantic Records, you know, on Trick's album based on the true story. You know what I mean? I did. I produced um, uh, He's a Hope But You Can't Help It. Um, and every album after that, I did at least one or two cuts, you know what I'm saying, based on our relationship. What was it like being with a young Trick Daddy at that time in the studio, first album? Uh, at that time, I wasn't in the studio with Trick. Oh, okay. It was just pretty much me submitting the beats because okay. Slip and Slide had their own producer called Funk Boogie. Okay. You know what I mean? And Funk Boogie, um, along with Ted and Trick, they would be uh, producing their own stuff. You know what I mean? So I would just submit beats and Funk, Bo Funk Boogie and Ted would go through it and pick it and then, you know, they would produce the songs. Gotcha. I would just submit beats. I so you. I wasn't really in the studio with Trick. Okay. You know what I mean? Like he would know of me, but we would just, um, um, he would just, you know, listen to the beats and be like, okay. You know, a lot of times my man Fence, shouts out the Fence, he would be the guy dealing with, you know, um, Ted and, um, you know, kind of like making the plays. Like your A&R a for everybody pretty much. Yeah, that's like, that's my dude. You know, he was the guy that was like the business. Right. You know, I was more so the talent. I didn't really care about the business. All I wanted to do was just make beats and, you know, just be productive doing that. Okay, so you're starting to get place, placements now at this point. Right. You know, starting to get your beats heard to the masses and everything like right. that. Where does DJing fall in, in that mix? Well, at that point... I stopped DJing. Okay. So what year is this? This was like uh, 95. Okay. 95, 96. Yeah, 95, 96. I kind of like put the DJing thing to the side because, you know, I found a new love for producing and making beats. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, but, but... Prior to that, you know, um, <laughs> I was um, uh, a reggae selector mm. in 93. Mm. You know, uh, I know I'm probably all over the place right now, but, you know, I just got to shed this because no one really knows. You know what I'm saying? history, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, uh, I was selecting for a sound called Black Shadow, okay? In Jamaica, they have different sound systems. OK, um, whereas, um, you know, they would um, play reggae and, you know, you have the one guy that would uh, select the records, pick the records. Right. Then you have a guy that spins it and you have a guy that talks it, that, that talks to the talk to the people. Right. And get the crowd hype. Toasting. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I was the guy that was um, selecting and spinning. You know what I mean? So. There was a point, a time where I was doing two things. You know, I was I was producing at the same at the same time. I was doing dance hall. You know, I would be at parties and clashes. Uh, um, you know, clashing other sounds. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And 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 that was when, and that was like in the night in 1993. And that's where I really got into dance hall reggae. Gotcha. I was always a fan, but actually to play the records. That was around the time that I was all the way in. You know what I mean? I even had dub plates cut from uh, Buji Bantan. Dub plates is like, wow. I don't know if you remember what dub plates are. But if the people don't know, explain to them well, what they're plates, Dub plates is basically where it's a lacquer. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a lacquer. Um, it's the actual test press before the records go into final pressing. Right. Okay, in Jamaica, a lot of the sounds, basically DJs, DJs meaning the ones that will play records, they would uh, 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 press a lot of exclusive uh, songs on there. Okay, they would cut it on lacquer. Okay, and at the time, uh, you know, all the Jamaican artists would cut, would, 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 would um, record exclusive songs for whoever the sound was, meaning the DJs. So back then you had Stone Love, you had Bodyguard, you had um, um, Black Cat, you had Kilimanjaro, Addies, Bass Odyssey. These are like sounds 
that I would listen to, you know what I mean, religiously. I had every Clash tape, you know what I mean? Um, so they would make exclusives for the sound. So say like if you had a, sound, uh, a song, um, they would recut that, that song and put their name in it, almost like a DJ drop. Right. But they would, they would say their names in it, and that sound would be the only sound to play it. You know what I mean? So Black Shadow, you know what I mean? They, um, they had a, 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 a song with, from, from Buju Bantan called um, Boom Bye Bye. Boom Bye Bye. Classic. You know what I mean? Classic. So we had it on the Punani rhythm. Doom, 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 doom. So he would sing that song. Um, he would sing Boom Bye Bye on that rhythm. You know what I mean? So he would wow. be like, yo, big up Black Shadow, tech! You know what I mean? Like, that's how the intros would be. Wow. You know what I mean? So, so it was like, that's a whole nother culture that I was a part of for a brief moment. You know what I mean? At the same time while still, you know, producing and uh, doing my thing. You know what I mean? But yeah, you know, um, dance hall is, is very, very, very influential in, 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 in my coming up. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a big fan of reggae dance hall from the 80s all the way to the early 90s. You know what I'm saying? I'm a big Bob Marley fan. I had every Bob Marley album. I knew every song. You know what I mean? Like, Bob Marley is that dude. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. But, but yeah, back to um, uh, what you were saying as far as um, After Luke and, and the committee and, and Slip and Slide. Yeah, so yeah. We were, I was doing a lot of songs with, with Trick, but we was never really in the studio until later on, you know, um, around the Thugs R Us album and I think Thug Matrimony. That's when we really started getting into, the, you know, being in the studio at the same time and, you know, just vibing with him. You know what I mean? So what's the creation process with Luke? Are you just bringing beats that you already made at your own studio and you just bringing them to, the, to, his, to his studio or to, to the session? Or are you really sitting down there and producing the record and like... Nah. Okay. Now, now, a lot of times the record was already produced and we just will be in there just touching up on a few things. You know gotcha. what I mean? You know, he'll be recording his verse and, you know, I'll, you know, I'll be like, yeah, okay, that sounds dope or, you know, um, do it this way. But Trick, shout out to Trick, man. You know what I mean? Like, Trick Trick is his own, own dude, man. Trick does what the fuck he wants. You know what I mean? Like, whatever you say is whatever. He gonna do what he wants. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, those records always came out dope and organic. Right. You know what I'm saying? So salute the trick. You know what I'm saying? Staying true to himself. You know what I mean? And 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 being that one of the staple MCs from Miami. You know what I mean? Because he told stories. You know what I mean? Trick wasn't like your average rapper. Trick would tell you and preach and give you game based on his experiences. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. And so yeah, that's what it was, man. Get fucked up. Get fucked up. <laughs> Get fucked up. Where should I start? Um, how did that come about? How did it come about? Just because that, that, at that time, even that sound of production was so unique to you. You know what I mean? As far right. as just like, I don't want to call it minimal to like downgrade it, but it wasn't mm -hmm. just like that overpowering, you know, uh, overly produced, mm -hmm. sometimes beats that you heard at that, at that time. Right, right. So just basically where the idea come from, how did y'all link up, so on and so forth. Okay, well, Get Fucked Up basically was the last song that made the album Street Money, um, Slip and Slide Electra, um, was the last song on the album because at the time we had a lot of crunk stuff, you know, a lot of crunk music around the town. Lil Jon was at his peak, you know what I mean, and Miami was still trying to like, um, how can I say this? We had our sound, but I don't feel like we embraced it as much. You know what I'm saying? We still was trying to like fit in with whatever was currently hot at the time. You know what I'm saying? So uh, at the time that we did Street Money, Fence uh, was like, um, you know, the, the majority of the songs were like crunk bass, you know, like, uh, bone crusher type, uh, Lil John slow tempo type, you know what I mean? Right. Um, and um, my man DJ Grio, DJ Grio was like uh, one of the main DJs at Cristal at the time. Him and Big Will, shouts out to Big Will, rest in peace. Um, um, 
he had Cristal on lock. And he was like, yo, man, y'all don't have a club record. Y'all don't have a club record. You know, you, you got all this crunk shit, but Miami is known for up-tempos. You know what I'm saying? Where's your up-tempo record? You know what I mean? So he was like, yo, you need, y'all need a record that can mix behind, at the time, was uh, uh, She's a Bitch, okay? And, and, and you need a record that can mix behind, um, uh, what, what record that was? Um, I think it was Shut Up at the time, you know what I mean? Okay. Uh, but the remix. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what like I'm saying? Like 115 or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 the remix, you know what I mean? So y'all need a record that can go behind that, you know? Um, and there was also another record that, that the DJs would play was... Um, a biggie record, the nasty girl on the she's a bitch beat. Gotcha. Dun, 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 I go mm, on and on and, and on, on and, 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 and they would kill that, you know what I'm saying? And that would be at the height of the energy in the club. You know what I'm saying? So Greer was like, Man, y'all need a fucking record that can mix about that can mix behind these records. So, okay, I was like, hmm, okay. I went back to the studio, right? Um, I did the pattern. The pattern was boom, 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 boom. You know, kind of basing it off Timbaland's drum pattern. You know what I mean? Uh, and 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 incorporating uh, Reby Jackson's centipede because that pattern wasn't. It's not a. It's not that Timbaland created. It was. It was done before, but you know he reintroduced it. I don't know what inspired him to do it, but that pattern was out before. You know what I mean? Right. So if you listen to Reby, Reby Jackson Centipede, it's like dum 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 dum. You know what I mean? So I was like, all right, let me try that bass line, but let me flip it a little bit. You know what I mean? So. uh Instead of going doom 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 doom, I went boom 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 mm-hmm. boom boom boom. You know what I mean? And that became the baseline for get fucked up. You know what I mean? And the string section was uh uh I don't want to say I the tiger because I the tiger didn't really inspire me until. Let me take that back. I noticed that after it was done, you know what I'm saying? I the Tiger was like, bam, 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 bam. Gotcha. Bam, 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 bam. You know what I mean? And before I realized that I was doing it, I was like, oh shit, okay, this works. But at the time, I wasn't thinking about I the Tiger. It just was some simple chords that I could play on a keyboard. Mm -hmm. Because I don't play keys, you know, I play by ear. So, you know, whatever chord sounded cool at the time that was easy for me to just, you know, do certain moves. If it sounded good, I'm going to go with it. So that particular chord was like, it was easy for me to do this on the keyboard. Right. And it sounded dope. You know what I mean? So I used the strings. Um, I, I stacked it with the horn stabs. You know, at the time, you know, Miami was known for the horns, you know. Um, shouts out to Funk Boogie again. Shouts out to Tony Galvin. Uh, these were the guys along with myself that kind of like uh, created that sound. You know what I'm saying? Um, so it only made sense. So with the horns, I put a lot of reverb on it to make it sound big. Bum, 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 you know what I mean? And it was just simple. There was no other sound in there. It was just that bass line, the strings and the horns, and a synth line. You know what I mean? So if you, if you listen to Get Fucked Up and the beat pattern, it has a lot of influences in it. It has, a, it has compa, it has Spanish, it has uh, uh, funk, you know what I mean? Like it's a whole collaboration of different genres mixed into one, you know what I mean? And um, I did the beat, Fence was like, okay, let's get everybody together, you know what I mean? Let's, let's try to come up with something. Fence is like very instrumental into, uh, into uh, creating that record, you know what I mean? But I got to give him the props for everything because he's the one that was like, okay, let's come up with a record. 
You know what I mean? Him and Stage McCloud. Stage McCloud is the guy that's on the hook. Stage McCloud, which is, he's McCleasy right now, is the guy from Grind Mode. And yeah, we're going to get into that. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, so um, he's the guy that's, if you smoke weed now in the club and you all want to clown, you know what I mean? So that's the guy on the hook. Wow. You know what I mean? So we all came together, you know, we in the studio, Hennessy on deck, weed on deck. We just getting fucking <laughs> fucked up. You know what I mean? And um, Fence was like, yo, uh, how about we try this hook? How many of y'all in the club tonight want to get fucked up? He came up with a whole nother cadence for the hook, but it was we felt like it was too wordy. You know what I mean? Definitely. So, you know, we kind of restructured it. You know what I'm saying? Um, stage was like, okay, you smoke weed now in the club and you all want to clown. Got a drink that you can't put down. What you going to do when it all goes down? Get fucked up. You know what I mean? And everybody was like, oh, shit. That's it. You know what I mean? And we just ran with it, you know what I mean? And and um, that was that, man. We put it together. It was um, it was a challenge getting everybody to accept what it was because it was so different at the time. Right. Because because that sound was different, you know. Especially the hook, you know. My man Track Five Three, shout out to Track Five Three. That's the homie. You know, he was the guy who actually you know was there with me uh, throughout my whole DJing stage. You know what I'm saying? So that's the homie. So he was doing mixing at the time. And he put the flanger, the meta flanger, if you're familiar with Pro Tools, you know what meta flanger is like that that is a is a flanger plug-in that 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 makes it so dope. So he put the flanger on stages vocals when he went now nah, like on the ad lib, because he would ad lib now nah, mm-hmm. clown down. So that shit would sound like yeah, you know what I mean? It sounded weird, but mm-hmm. it was new and dope at the time and fresh. So it was like, fuck it. Let's just run with this shit. You know what I mean? Um, so when we did it, DJ Griot got the record. Big Will. Shouts out to Big Will again. He would always play it behind She's a Bitch. So when you hear She's a Bitch, dun 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 yeah. Right. Bump, bump, bump. Then he'll go back. Bump. Then he'll he'll go back to she's a bitch, getting the crowd familiar with the song. So he would play she's a bitch for a half a bar. Then he will cut in get fucked up for half a bar. Then after a while, people start getting it. Then it got to a point where, when the record was popping, everybody was fucking on the club. I mean, in the club, turning up. On the on the on the table on the bar tables, it got to the point where <laughs> the promoters would threaten DJ Grio, like, "Listen, do not play this record." Wow! Because it was a whole frenzy. Anytime that record would play, it shit was frenzy. I'm talking about shit would get crazy in the club. You know what I mean? So promoters would <laughs> try to stop Grio from playing a record because it was so much energy. And that's what, and that's what, you know, gave it his legs. You know what I'm saying? Wow. And that's what inspired everybody to want to like find out who the fuck are these guys, you know? And with the icons, um, everybody thought that it was a group, but in actuality, it wasn't really a group. It was just all the people, all the artists that we signed, that we had signed at the label at the time. You know, not, you know, no different from Rough Riders, no different from um, who else had a click? It was Rough Riders. Uh, Death Row, you know what I mean? Cash so, money, no limit. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, you know, like with Rough Riders, they had their Eve, they had their DMX, they had their locks. So, icons, it was like, okay, we got Chapter, we got Luke Duke, we got Star, Stage with Cloud, you know what I'm saying? Tony Manchino, you know what I mean? So, being that everybody was on that one song and they were all new artists, people thought that the icons was just a group, but it really wasn't a group. It was just all the artists in that label on that one record. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So so it was uh, <laughs> hard to market the song because everybody was, you know, everybody was their own artist. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, that shit was uh, monumental, man. And it was like a, a point where um, we really was at 
the top of the game for Miami, you know, because at the time nobody else was doing it. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, man, that's 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 get fucked up. All right. So what BPM was get fucked up at? One eighteen. One eighteen. One eighteen. Yeah. I always thought like that one ten to one twenty range in hip hop is always kind of like a funny area. I personally like it, mm -hmm. but. You know, especially at that time, especially when that record come out, that was kind of like uncharted territory, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was definitely uncharted because at the time, you know, like I said, you know, like um, the majority of hip hop was like, uh, you know, the DJs would be comfortable with spinning records that was like ninety, you know, uh, hundred BPMs, one hundred and two, you know, it wouldn't, it it wouldn't go past one hundred and eight or one hundred and nine because at that point it would be too fast for what was current on the universal level. Right. You know what I'm saying? But here in Miami, you know, we like shit up tempo. You know what I mean? Like like that was just um um the hip hop scene here in Miami. Well, you know, Miami bass music, you know, go figure. It's bass music. Bass music was always like started off at 128 all the way to sometimes 150. You know, Slow. not double time. Yeah. I'm talking about boom, 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 boom. It was oh, like, yeah, 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 you know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? So, so here, uh, the tempos were different. You know what I mean? So we had to make it a little more up so the people can really get into it. You know what I mean? So, so a lot of DJs really didn't know how to uh, transition into a Miami set because of the tempo difference. You know what I'm saying? And even to this day... <laughs> Every song is fucking sped up. Songs that are like 100, you got certain DJs that will make that shit sound like it's fucking 120 BPMs, which me personally, I hate that shit. I hate that. I, I wish they stopped fucking doing that shit because you change the feel of the original record. You know what I'm saying? Like, like yeah, it's cool, but don't change the vibe of the record because shit sounds different fast. Yeah, you can vibe to it, you can dance to it, but don't change the whole <laughs> molecular st structure of the song. You know what I mean? So um, I still I still hate that shit. You know what I'm saying? You still you still got a lot of DJs that will speed shit all the way to fuck up. Like they it, don't know how to vibe to the crowd with that original tempo. Not even original, but you can speed it up a little bit. Let's say like if you at a hundred. 105 okay. is like 105. That's, that's like fine. Yeah. Don't like go a from 100 to 110. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? Like, you just changed the whole goddamn record. <laughs> now this shit sound like fucking chipmunks. You know what I mean? And you really can't get into the feel of the song. You know what I mean? Because everybody used to hearing it that fast. And now when you hear the original version, oh, this shit sounds slow. You know what I mean? Crazy. You know? Um, but I think that's only because some DJs don't know how to transition. They don't know how to make a record blend without speeding it up so fast. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's a big, big, big problem. You know what I mean? But I don't, I don't hate it because that is Miami. You know what I mean? You know, they all speed it up to the highest so you know, they can dance. You know another place that they do that and you wouldn't even think? Detroit. Detroit. There's a lot of... There's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of similarities with Detroit club music in Miami. You know what I'm saying? The house um, music, Detroit house music. Detroit house music. Ghetto house. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and I feel like, excuse me, I feel like a lot of the new dance music that's coming out of Miami was kind of inspired by, well, the drum patterns. I may be wrong. You know what I mean? Don't quote me on this, but I know there's there right now there's a there, there's a pattern that that uh a lot of um I feel like the up tempo Miami music is similar to the Jersey, which is boom, 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 boom. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I think that's Jersey. Or Baltimore. Or Baltimore. Yeah. Not Jersey, but yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that vibe is 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 I don't think it's Miami. But Miami will take it. Or people from Jacksonville will take it and do some hyping over it, and it becomes something totally different. You know what I mean? Like seven five hop, you know, all these new dances 
the patterns are identical. Boom, 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 boom. That ain't, that ain't boom, 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 boom. That ain't that. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. You know what I'm saying? So it's just taking bits and pieces of something that's already out there and you, you know, making it, you know, your own. Right. You know what I'm saying? Which is music anyways. You know what I'm saying? Music is always transitioning into something totally different. Do you feel like now, especially in these more recent years with the internet kind of making the world smaller as it is anyways, yeah. there used to be a big distinction between, oh, this is East Coast, this is West Coast, this is Midwest, this yeah. is Texas. Yeah. Now you're having records from New York coming out, they sound like they're from Atlanta. You're having records from the West Coast coming out, they sound like they're from here. Do you like that change and with with the younger generation they don't really look at geography as much or right. do you like having areas having their own identity like this is a miami record this is a new orleans record well um man music is so universal man like you know i can't really hate on the tra on, on the transformation on uh, as far as where it is right now because of all the influences you know what i'm saying a lot of the la records a lot of the bay area records uh, they sound like Miami records, you know what I'm saying? You know, back then in the eighties, uh, when, um, the two live crew was doing their thing, you had Egyptian lover from, from the West coast doing the same tempo, you know what I'm saying? So as far as new, uh, LA and Miami, the tempos around that time was similar. As far as the, you know, when you when you got into the up tempos, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, with Atlanta, you know, uh, being uh, responsible for most of a lot of the hits at that tempo, it's just easy for it was just made it easier for other people that weren't from Atlanta to kind of like conform to that tempo because that's what's currently hot and that's what people are used to. You know what I'm saying? I I really can't hate on that because that's just how music goes right you know what i'm saying it just evolves you know if you want to accept it you're cool if you don't want to accept it then you know what i'm saying you just got to be able to uh adjust with the time and that's how i feel uh, just adjusting do i like it uh i'm not a big fan i'm not a big fan of what's going on right now but it's a it's a new generation you know they've been inspired by something that's been bubbling from years before Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I understand it. You dig? So, um, yeah, you know, it is what it is, man. Everybody's inspired by something that's currently hot at the moment. You know what I mean? So speaking of just the tempos that kind of work down here in Florida and Miami specifically, you know, going into the junk music, we're talking about that up-tempo vibe in music is what mm -hmm. we call it back in Atlanta, you know what I mean? Right. But Tell me, like, what formulated that? Because that's different than, you know, get fucked up. That's different than a lot of the stuff that you heard prior to that. But it's kind of like a up up tempo R and B. That's basically what it is, man. Um, people say that um, I, I created that sound. You know what I mean? Uh, maybe I did. I'm not sure. I'm just. I was just doing what. I do naturally. You feel what I'm saying? And 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 my inspirations. You dig? Like I said, you know, I'm an old school cat. I like a lot of feel good music. You know what I'm saying? Um, with before we get into grime mode, we got to do Bar Greasy. Talk about it. Okay, Bar Greasy. Shouts out to Bar Greasy, the homie. Um, we um. I'm I'm a, I'm a huge fan of old school music. You know what I'm saying? It's obvious. You dig? I'm a huge fan of old school music because old school music never dies. Old school music stays new and relevant. You can play old school any time of the day. You're going to feel that shit because the instrumentation is totally different. You know what I mean? You got live musicians. You got live bass player. You know, you got music that's created for the soul. You feel what I'm saying? So, with Ball Greasy, um, well, before Ball Greasy, with that, there was a song that was was a, a favorite um, that I used to always play called No Stopping That Rocking by Instant Funk. You know what I'm saying? 
uh, and that was a known classic here in Miami. Shouts out to Disco Dave. He was like one of the one of the DJs that broke that record. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And he would play that record. He would make tapes, not to get off, but he would make tapes slow down before DJ Screw started doing his shit. For real? Facts. He would make tapes, echo tapes, like you would hear his voice, just go day, 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 the world famous, 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 famous. And he would slow the music down uh, because when you slowed it down, you would hear the bass a lot more. And we would have people in cars playing his tapes because the bass would hit a lot more. You know what I'm saying? So, so I always heard that people would slow down Mike's tapes to get... The, the you know the wolf was really you know wobbling in the car like right, that right. but but Disco Dave was actually doing it and Disco then putting it Dave, out Disco Dave was doing it with R and B music Disco Dave was not doing it with rap music oh because around that time that's what I'm saying he was the in my opinion he was the founder of Screw not Chop but Screw meaning slow down you know what I'm saying because he would make tapes he would make echo tapes you know what I'm saying. With all the songs slowed down. R&B. R&B. R&B and funk and slow songs. So, you know, I really was a big screwhead growing up. So, mm-hmm. the DJ out in Houston, OG Ron C, mm-hmm. he had his mixtape series called Fuck Action. Right. And he had like about 200 different volumes of it. And it's all straight R&B or oh. old school. See, I didn't know that. But this is, this is definitely, I mean, I don't know what year you're talking about. Dave was doing that, but... You know, Ron Dave was, was doing this in the 80s. Okay, so it's definitely before that then. Yeah. I mean, th- this is way before what OG Ron was doing. Right. This is before even people were thinking about slowing music down like that anyways. Right, right, right. So Disco Dave is the originator of screwed music, you I, say. In my opinion. Wow. He's where I heard it first. You know what I'm saying? Everybody in the hood that had verts and they had sounds in the system would play Disco Dave tapes. You know what I'm saying? And you would hear him, Disco Dave, 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 Dave. Laying it down, 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 real strong, 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 strong. All the echo, the delays, and you hear the soul songs. Boom, 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 boom. Like the shit would be dope. You know what I'm saying? Wow, so, so I gotta this get one of those. Day, um, was one of the one of the guys that would um, make uh, uh, funk funk CDs, like uh, what tapes? Yeah. You know what I mean? And no stopping that rocking was one of the songs. Okay, so. Being that that song was like one of my favorites, there was a part on there that it broke down into You know what I mean? So I was like, man, I I need to make a beat using that chord progression, Mm -hmm. right? And um, doing that hook, singing that little part. So me and um, uh, Alex Account, Alex Account, that's the other homie. He's the guy that plays, uh, I don't know if you ever saw Bloodline, but it's a local movie out of Miami produced by um, Fence, Fence and um, Antoine Smith. You know, he's the tall guy that plays Alex. You know what I mean? So we was like, yo, we should flip this record. So I flipped the beat. Um, I did the hook, the reference hook. All right. And we brought Greasy in, like, yo, this that track. Do your thing on there. And Greasy fell in love with it. You know what I mean? He went into the studio and recorded the verse. And he did his hook. But he did the hook wrong. Okay. Because he was just kind of like trying to remember how I did it. But he did it the wrong way. Which still, if you hear it right now, it's still the wrong way. You know what I mean? It's not the way how I intended it to be. But we just kept it because it was organic. All right, fuck it. Let's leave it as it is. You know what I'm saying? And um, and that was like uh, around the time that you know we I, the, the, the 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 that track had that music element up tempo. You know what I'm saying? And I think that was like one of the first records that spawned the Jip movement, mm-hmm. right? Um, but uh, and that's on the music side. You know, like as far as like you know the R&B feel good type vibe, but prior to that, I had did a record with Jackie O called um, Pussy Real Good, right. which had elements of um, 
um, um, uh, laid back white horse. Right? It had elements of white horse. It had elements of funky soul Makosa. That, that rhythm track. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So if you listen to if you listen to I'm hearing it now in my head. I definitely hear all those elements. Exactly, exactly. So at the time, you know, in Miami, people were juking to like certain songs, you know, and they would do their own dance. Juking wasn't like what it what it is now. Okay. You know what I mean? It was like the early stages of juking. Shouts out to Dietrich Val. Dietrich is like another guy who was very instrumental into um the the um the the production process and the ideas. You know what I mean? It's like, yo, tech, you need to use that funky soul Makosa and, you know, do something with that. You know what I mean? So, of course, I was like, all right, yeah, shit, that sounds dope. Because here in Miami, we always rock out to old school shit, sped up, but, you know, the vibe was like, okay, this is what it is. So, I incorporated that with um, those elements, the laid back white horse, and that created Nook, uh, Pussy Real Good for Jackie O. Right. You know what I mean? So, that was my early attempt to, like, do jump music, you know, where you can dance a certain way, you know, left, right, you know what I mean, like this. But the up tempo shit was um, was really like experimental. Like everybody kind of took to it and started. They called it juke, right? But it was a little faster, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, um, Shone spawned a new era, you know what I mean? After Shone, um, I did the I'm So High which is basically uh, almost the same element as far as... The tempo was a lot faster, but this time I decided to use jazz chords. Because if you listen to that, the, the composition on I'm So High, it, it sounds almost similar, but it's, it's jazzier. Gotcha. You know, you got a little more uh, fifths. You know what I mean? Like if, if, you, if you know... If you know uh, uh, um, Chord progression, you know, fifths is like when you have a jazz key in there, a jazz note in there. You know what I'm saying? So with I'm So High, I only use like probably four keys because the keyboard at the time had patches that has a chord. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And um, I used that and uh, created a whole feel good vibe. And ironically, sexual seduction was out too. Shorty Red. Shorty Red. You know what I mean? So everybody thought it was like, damn, did Shorty Red bite off of you guys or did you guys bite off Shorty Red? And I'm like, uh, nah. You know, we didn't even, sexual seduction wasn't even out at the time. I, that, I never even heard that shit. You know what I mean? But it just so happened that uh, we just happened to be on the same wavelength. You know what I mean? That's why I was big in Atlanta. Because there's another Shawty Red record that was out was Drifter. Drifting, yeah. With Big Gip yeah. from the, from a Goody. Right. So those were big records in the club, but especially the strip clubs. Right, right. And so when you went out to the strip clubs, you would hear, if you heard anything up-tempo, because <laughs> mind, mind you, this is the era where Jeezy and Gucci Jeezy, and everything was running. Jeezy, that's what I'm saying, the whole trap era. Exactly. If you heard anything up-tempo, it would have been that sexual eruption, mm -hmm. sexual seduction, the <laughs> Drifter, eruption. the Drifter record. Or even a record, a classic underground record, but still gets so much love. All that money by Young Dro. Okay, yeah. That record right there gets so much love in Atlanta, still on some up simple stuff. But you know, growing up for me in Atlanta, we always, you know, we came under that social death, you know, of course, era. Of course. So you you would hear, especially on the mix on the radio at night, you would hear an R and B song that was the slow, double time, Nathan. with a yeah, yeah. With, with a with a with a with the bass beat behind the it. The bass behind it, yep. You know, yep, and that's yep. really how a lot of club DJs were DJing back in those days because you're not going to play a slow-ass R&B record in the middle right, of the height right. of the night, but you put that double-time beat behind it, you can make anything pop, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Even even if they made the record like Candy, uh, Don't Think I'm Not, you know what I'm saying? Right, right, like, right. That was just classic for us, but, um, you know, to hear the resurgence of it because being, being back in Atlanta, we were hearing what was coming out down here in Miami. right. We're like, oh yeah, we're definitely throwing this Similarities, in the mix. Similarities, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's like, like I said, like certain certain genres um, or certain times, you get inspired by it. You know what I mean? Right. So I think it was just that. And in, in, in Miami, um, since I'm a big fan of you know old school vibes and 
music, you know, it just only made sense uh, to do those type of beats, you know, and they kind of like put their own spin on it. You know what I mean? Like I didn't say, well, hey, this is what this is going to be. But when you get different kids and different dancers and doing their own shit, creating their own movement, oh shit, this is the vibe movement. Oh, this is a vibe. Oh, okay, then that's what it is. Boom. It became vibe music, vibe jerky music. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, okay, oh, that's what y'all doing. All right, that's what it is. You know what I mean? So um, I did a few more of the records using the same core patch, the same sound. You know what I mean? Um, around that time, and that kind of like, like I said, it spawned a whole new movement here in Miami and Florida. You know what I'm saying? And that's what became, you know, what it is today. And 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 they still do it right now. You know what I'm saying? It's a little different, but it's not too far from where it originated from. I would say doing sets down here, since I've been down here, you know, that grind mode always, always will get Listen, the party man, going. You shouts know? out the grind mode. Shouts out the chaos. Shouts out the hunger. Shouts out the McCleasy. You know what I mean? Like, they, they really... Um, put their foot in that record because at the time it was nothing like it you know what i mean and the concept that stage put on there i'm so high was very clever you know what i'm saying because it wasn't he wasn't saying i'm so high like you know smoke it was just I, he was high on the vibe and the music you know and um um, you know, of course, everybody was rolling then, right? You know, on X and shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, oh shit, that shit come on. It's like, damn, it was just perfect. Did you ever hear the Kid Cudi version? Of course I did. <laughs> of course I did, man. I was like, yo, that's dope. Kid Cudi jumped on that. And then Ross jumped Ross on jumped that. On you know it what I'm saying? Ja Ross jumped on the Sean remix too. You know uh, what I'm saying? He yeah. has a version on there too. You know what I'm saying? Shouts out to Ross. Shouts out to Kid Cudi. You know what I mean? But it just shows you that. The connection and the way those records made certain people feel right. when it came on. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? To this day, I'm, anytime I'm so high comes on in the club, it's the same feel. It's like, damn, this shit vibe. You know what I mean? Like, this shit feels good. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Uh, once again, shouts out to McCleasy, man. McCleasy. Because he, he, didn't, he didn't stick to the local content. You know, I feel like a lot of uh, the records that came after that, they didn't really, they didn't really think outside the box. They just kept it local by, you know, I'm in my zone, I'm in my vibe, this is that. But okay, what else can you talk about other than that? Right. You know, you got to be able to uh, set the pace where people on a universal level can connect with what you're saying. I'm in my zone, I'm in my vibe, it's a Miami thing, yeah, but let's not keep it local, you know, let's come up with some dope concept that can connect on a major level, you know what I'm saying, and that's what McCleasy did with I'm So High, you know what I'm saying, because I'm So High, what, shit, I'm, I could be I'm So High on music, I'm So High on life, yep. I'm So High on whatever drug you're on at the time, <laughs> you know what I mean, mm -hmm. so, you know, it, he didn't make it, he didn't make it local, you know, even though there was a part on there where he kind of did a break, for, a Miami break, you know what I'm saying? But it just made sense, you know what I'm saying? Um, so, yeah, you know, that's that's what it was, man. That's what it was. How do you feel about present-day hip-hop culture in Miami? I feel very good, man, because I feel like um, um, they've definitely stepped up uh, content-wise. Okay, shouts out to Major Nine, shouts out to um, Kid Omar, shouts out to um, who else? Who else? Who else I can think of? Um, damn, I'm, I'm a little lit right now. I can't think of everybody. You, you didn't give me too many Hennessy shots. Too much hand off. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of new artists that are coming out with songs that has content. You know what I'm saying? Chaotic 305. Um, Steel Drums, uh, Flam Gotti, you know what I mean? Um, who else? Who else? Who else? Who else I can think of right now? 
Um, there's a few artists, man, you dig, uh, that, are, that, that are doing their thing that are not just talking about the basic shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're really speaking of their personal experiences where you can actually connect with. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, um, Ball Greasy. Ball Greasy, that's my dude. You know what I mean? Like, that dude is, is <laughs> has a crazy pen. You know what I mean, and 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 and, and he got it, and he and, and he he understands. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Zoe Dollars, very lyrical. You right. know what I'm saying? Like that dude goes in. You know what I mean? It's a few of them, man. Like I'm just remembering as 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 as, our, as time's going, but I feel like Miami music is at a, is at a good place because now, you know, we're tapping into lyricism, and still being being able to keep the balance between. Uh, Dope hooks, but with lyrical content. Right. You know what I'm saying?